Welcome, good afternoon for uh, our uh, webinar session from the Elicitre Group uh, under the Agricola School of, for Sustainable Development. It is the last um, uh, webinar of the, of the season, so we're very happy to have uh, a friend and a colleague presenting today, Lucas Lindsay, on the politics of illicit trade statistics. Um, Lucas has been with, um, uh, with the University of Groningen since 2019. He was previously uh, a postdoctoral uh, at the University of Amsterdam, and then um, uh, before he has his he had his PhD on um, at the uh, the London School of Economics. Sorry, I, I got distracted from the outside. So it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, this is again, as I was saying, this is the last event of the Lisi Trade Group for the year, and then we're very happy to have a look, uh, Lucas uh, giving us a presentation today. So without further ado, we have a, a nice audience. So if you, anybody's interested, please ask questions in the chat. We'll try to be present. And then after Lucas' presentation, we're going to have a, a, a round of Q&A. Without further ado, Lucas, thank you again for uh, being with us today. And the floor is yours. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Francesco, for the introduction and also the opportunity to present some past and ongoing research. And my talk will be structured in a kind of two parts. In the first part, I'll talk a bit more about the research that I've done in the past few years, which is more generally about the politics of statistics, and in particular, the politics of international economic statistics, statistics and international trade and capital flows. But I've been looking mostly with Daniel Mugge, who is at the University of Amsterdam, I've been looking mostly at statistics on licit cross-border activities. And more recently, together with Francesco Svalseiki and Len Seabrook, who is at the Copenhagen Business School, we've started to kind of extend this research program to look more at, a, at different kinds of statistics, which has some peculiar feature that makes it arguably even more interesting, which are statistics on illicit activities, which is an ongoing project that uh, I'll talk about more in the second part. And if you have any questions during the talk, please feel also free to interrupt me and can also take questions and otherwise also at the end, of course, I hope we'll have time, sufficient time for Q&A. Without any further ado, then let me get started on the first part, so the politics of international economic statistics more broadly. I'll be drawing, but mostly from this uh, piece in the Review of International Political Economy, which is, I think, kind of a, a bigger overview of, of the of the project as a whole and have some other publications that dig into more, more specific parts which i can also talk more about the q a uh, to kind of focus more on, on the bigger picture so why should we start study international economic statistics in the first place as, as kind of an object of analysis as researcher based in international relations or ir so that is because this data is actually very frequently and in many different contexts, many different fields of IR being used as kind of an important input to analyze social phenomena. You can think about fields on, for example, trade and conflict. There's a lot of research that has looked at whether international trade increases or decreases the risk of conflict between states or also inside countries, more civil wars. It's a big stream of literature, more in the comparative political economy, literature on globalization, the welfare states, whether a state being more integrated in the international economy is able to, to pursue the fiscal policies that they wish and so on. A lot of literature on the political economies of capital flows, so capital flows between countries. Or you can think about things like foreign direct investments and how it, foreign direct presence of multinational corporations affects political regimes. There's a huge range of, of questions in the field of IR, political science, and also in economics beyond, where this data on trade and capital flows between countries is being used to come to certain inferences and conclusions of, of what's going on in the international system. And for that reason, the quality of this data is quite important. And we talk about the measurement quality, do different aspects of the measurement quality, what makes a good measure. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So the first dimension of a quality measure is, is its accuracy. So how accurately does it actually measure what we want or think we are measuring? But the second dimension <clears throat> refers more to the concept validity. So that is whether the measure that we use actually captures the phenomenon that we think it should uh, measure in terms of more the theoretical concept that, that underlies it. And as you might 
suspect in kind of the baseline of our paper is that both of these dimensions, both the accuracy and the validity, there are quite the significant issues and problems which so far have been not the really acknowledged so much by researchers in IR and, and the social sciences more broadly of the people who use this data. So as a first step in the paper, <clears throat> we start with a, a survey that we did with economists, international economists mostly, who use this data, so the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, balance of payment statistics, which summarizes uh, data on uh, trade flows and capital flows between countries. And we simply ask the economists who have published using this data, what they think, how accurate that this data actually is or not. And we've given them different kind of numbers out of the IMF BOP statistics on different kinds of, of cross-border flows, as you can see, merchandise trade, service trade, but also foreign direct investment and portfolio capital flows. And we gave some of them numbers from Sweden and some of them from the Philippines to also take into account that like the level of uh, economic development might affect how uh, users see the, the quality of this data. And we ask them, like, if you see this data point, what would you think is kind of the margin of error that, that, that might be in this figure? What is quite interesting for all these figures, and it doesn't really matter whether we said it's a capital flow or a trade flow, whether it's from the Philippines or Sweden, the modal response throughout the board is kind of 5%. So I think it's interesting because it captures, on the one hand, that data users, economists, are aware that the data is not perfect, most of them, right? So that there is some error margin coming with them. But it's also not very big, right? 5%, it's kind of manageable uh, margin of error. And in the same survey, we further also asked them about what they think, whether the, the quality of international economic statistics has evolved over the past 20 years. And there's a, a very large majority, as you can see on, on the graph here, that agrees or strongly agrees with the, sta the statement that the quality of international economic statistics has improved over the past 20 years. That might seem very intuitive, right? Because over the last 20 years, we've had a lot of technological progress, better computers and so on, uh, and more ways to, to capture data also online and so on. And so this is just, you could think that there's good reasons why the data would be getting better. However, this kind of views are quite interesting if we contrast them with what the statisticians told us, because we then also did a lot of uh, semi-structured interviews with statisticians at international organizations, the IMF and other organizations that actually produce this data. And they told us actually pretty much the opposite. So they said that we should be careful with these measures. So the accuracy is actually can be quite low. There are big error margins. Now what's maybe more surprising also that they think that the data is getting worse. And that's something that we can also in some of the reports written by statisticians, you see also here a quote from an IMF report from 1992, where the working party on balance of payment statistics expressed their concerns that all the evidence points to a progressive degradation of the quality of data in international capital flows. And why is that? So the key reason for the degradation in the quality of international economic statistics is that international economic statistics are still very much measured on a, a view of the world economy as being constituted of different national containers and it's uh, collected by national governments and they want to have numbers on the national trade or capital flows coming in and out of the country. However, over the last 30, 40 years, of course, with globalization, global production and also finance has very much been denationalized and we have much more complex transnational relationships and networks which are kind of at odds with how this data is being collected which is kind of still in you know, an old view of, of the international systems being just in these national units or as uh, one interviewee a statistician at the world trade organization see in the bottom uh, expressed this so he said that global value chains and transfer pricing strategies create difficulties for the validity of certain statistical constructs. The question is to what extent the statistical concepts are still aligned with economic reality. And I think this quote very much speaks to this second dimension of measurement quality or this concern that because globalization has changed the economic structures so much, while the way we measure the economy has not 
change very much leads to growing discrepancies between the concepts that we want to measure and what we're actually measuring. I can now give you a couple of concrete illustrations of the, this, some of these measurement problems. So what you can see on the graph here is a politically highly important and much discussed figure. So this is the, the US trade deficit with Mexico or the, on the, the Mexican surplus with the United States. And what is interesting about bilateral trade from a measurement perspective is that bilateral trade, so trade between two countries, each transaction is measured twice, right? Each uh, container that goes from Mexico to the US is the Mexican customs, they register that container and the US uh, also registered as an import, so it's an export from Mexico, it's an import from the United States. So both customs agencies independently measure the same thing. That means for all bilateral trade flow, we have two observations, which are so-called mirror statistics. And in theory, of course, these records should match, right? It should be, uh, or, or at least be very close to each other. And this is the figure you see on the Mexican merchandise trade surplus with the United States based on the American data. So this is the data collected by the US Statistics Office, what goes out and comes into the United States from Mexico a particular year. And you can see that there is a, a, a trade deficit from the US perspective with Mexico, which increases from about $20 billion in 1995 to around $60 billion by 2007, and then kind of stabilizes around that point. But we can also measure exactly the same quantity as the US trade deficit with Mexico with the Mexican data. And in theory, we should get kind of a similar picture. However, in practice, if we do that, we looks very differently. So if we calculate the US trade deficit with Mexico using what the Mexican customs authorities report to have sent to the US and received from the US, you get figures that are far off from what the, the Americans say. They are smaller in some years and much bigger in others. And this is a phenomenon that we don't observe only for US-Mexico. We look at this for many different uh, country pairs. And that's this kind of discrepancies are actually quite common. So here this graph just shows a simple scatter plot of all the mirror trade records that we have, which in theory, if they were the same, you should have kind of a nice straight line in the middle. But you can see for many, many, many pairs of countries, the data is, is pretty far off from each other. And this is also implications for causal inferences. Because in another paper, we use this then to do a lot of replication analysis of previous studies in international relations and other close disciplines to see whether it matters that this, these measurement errors in, in the mirror statistics might actually matter for the kind of conclusions that we draw from this from running cross national regressions, which is something that's very commonly done in international relations. So this is one example by a paper by a Canadian economist, Andy Rose, and it's a famous paper published in the American Economic Review, which is one of the leading journals in economics which he made this very curious finding that he found that the, the membership of the World Trade Organization or the GATT, so the General Agreement Trade of Tariff, that preceded WTO seems to actually decrease bilateral trade flows between countries, which is very much counterintuitive. And thus also the paper made a big impact. And so in this other study, so we, we replicated this paper first and just with the kind of the same data that the original study used. And we then rerun the analysis with the subset of data only for which we have two mirror records. And we first do this, then the, the same study with the same model, all, all being the same using the import data, which was the original study used. And we find the same kind of weird pattern that being a member of the GATT or WTO seems to be associated with less trade among country pairs. But if we do exactly the same thing, and the only thing we do change is that we switch the mirror. So we use the uh, trade data from the other country, the, the, the mirror country, so to speak. And we run exactly the same model. We get a completely different result in this case. And it actually suddenly suggests that actually GET or WTO member are trading much more than than before. So it's exactly the opposite conclusion that you can draw simply by depending on whether you use the exporters or the importers data, which is quite a problem. 
And we've done many more replications. It's not always so dramatic, the, the difference between switching between the mirrors, but we found in most of the studies we looked at that, that the, it does actually matter in different ways and can also help us nuance the findings a bit more if, if we look at uh, both of these mirror entries and try to take these measurement errors a bit more into account in statistical analysis. And this now I've been talking mostly about trade data, merchandise trade data. And in the bigger picture of balance of payments statistics, although trade data has issues, quite significant ones in many instances, is still actually among the best data that we have on international economic affairs. If you move from merchandise trades to trading services or then even capital flows, which you have here at the bottom, so foreign direct investments or portfolio capital flows, which are harder to measure, more complex kinds of phenomena, as you would expect, these kind of measurement errors, as far we can tell, are, if anything, much larger for, for these other kinds of international economic transactions that they are for merchandise trade. You can see on the bottom, in particular for portfolio capital flows, discrepancies are, are, are really seem to be really huge and there are big questions about the reliability for that kind of data. So what are the sources of these measurement problems? Why? do we have these discrepancies in the data? So there's on the one hand, certainly there are technical and logistical challenges and measuring the economy is maybe not as simple as it may seem from the outside. In the, practically, there's a lot of small differences that can make add up to a big difference in the, in the numbers that you have at the end, such as different countries using different accounting standards or transaction being classified differently in the records or different time period and so on. That, that certainly does play a role. But as said, it also has to do with globalization and this change in how the economy works, how goods are being produced, how capital is flowing around the world. And, and on the one hand, on the other hand, how the statistics are being collected, which is still very much on this national basis, collected by national governments who are interested in kind of the, the national imports and exports of, of things, which contrasts with the denationalization of economic production, but also ownership structures in the global economy. In addition to that, there's also growing importance in the economy of intangible assets, which are much more difficult to measure. And there also has a lot of uh, accounting ambiguities. And we also, especially for capital flows, there's things such as the financial liberalization and the innovation over the past decades, which have made capital markets much more complex and much more difficult to monitor. And at the same time, also the loss of some traditional data collection systems, which such related to things such as regional integration, such as in the European Union, where we had the, with the customs union, the abolishment of, of customs checks, which is of course a very good thing in many ways, but for the collection of trade data, this is not such a, a, a good development because we now have to find new ways to kind of infer how much is, is, goods are moving between two EU countries because this is not checked anymore. So this is the kind of data that, that you lose, which can also increase measurement problems. So this is on the one hand, the, the measurement accuracy problem, but maybe arguably the even bigger problem is, is, is this concept validity point, which relates to these transformations. And what we referred to in the paper as is this concept measurement gap, so gap between the theoretical concept and how the measures we use to proxy those uh, are actually what they actually capture. So, in commonsensical terms, if you think about a trade flow, a foreign direct investment or a portfolio uh, flow between two countries, as it is kind of captured in the textbooks of international economics or international relations, you think about a phenomenon where there is a meaningful crossing of a national border and also a change of ownership across borders. However, the way in which the statistics are being measured and the statistical standards, how they are being defined, actually very often violate these two assumptions. And without spending too much time on that, I can just highlight kind of three examples how globalization has kind of undermined this idea of having this cross-border change in ownership and uh, even having a cross-border transaction at all. So one is the re-exporting trade, as you may know with global production chains or global value chains. There is a much more what is also called pass-through trade. There's a lot of trade 
going from one country to another country, not because that other country is the final destination, but because it's part of a global supply chain. Maybe there's something else being done to this product in this other country, or even nothing is done. It's just being sent to another factory, then sent to another factory in other countries somewhere else. So there's a lot of trade that goes passes through many countries until it actually ends up at the final destination. But this is something that commonly used trade statistics don't capture. Because you cannot really tell if a trade flow coming to a country actually is consumed in the country, stays in the country, or it's just being then moved on to another country. And this is growing, accounting for an increasingly big share of total global trade flows. In the field of foreign direct investments, there's huge measurement problems which with what's called special purpose entities or SPE, FDI, which more colloquially you can think of as letter box companies. As you may know, the Netherlands is one of the big kind of tax havens for these kind of things. In Amsterdam, there's a famous Amstelgebouw, the, the tower that officially is home to, I'm not sure, like some five to 10,000 companies or so. But of course, these companies are not really there. They're just registered there for mostly tax reasons. So they have a legal domicile. But most of these companies, they don't really do anything in the Netherlands. But because they have these tax deals, companies then often declare certain activities to, to belong to this company, holding company that is based in the Amstelgebouw or somewhere else in the Netherlands, that is then captured as FDI, just following the, the, the guidelines how FDI is being measured, even though in reality it's, it's much more on, on paper transaction, not really real economic activity of a multinational in the Netherlands. A third example relating to services trade closely related to that is also phenomenon of transfer pricing or that uh, companies put their legal domiciles in low tax jurisdictions and then they can give the property rights to a certain good or service that they produce to uh, an, a subsidiary in, in this low tax jurisdiction and then they can say that the profits have been made by that subsidiary and which is all legal to do but it creates big problems because then you start to say that there's a tra or measure a, a services trade flow between this ta tax, uh, low tax jurisdiction and, and the headquarter economy, even though in reality, nothing is really traded. It's, it's really just a, an accounting feature. And there's many more examples like that, where you get a, a growing gap between what we think about a kind of a, a, the trade or capital flow between two countries, which in reality is, is a much more complex phenomenon, which often it does not really correspond to that. And that also raises, I guess, some bigger questions about what we should really do with this balance of payment statistics, whether they're really up to the job that we as academics often use them. And there's some interesting quotes from the statisticians we talk to as part of the research, which uh, had some interesting views on that. So there's one IMF economist who said that, well, these statistics, they are useful to compare broad trends across countries, but you can't really use them to compare differences in levels because not every country collects them in the same way and so on. But of course, differences in levels is what mostly researchers in economics and international relations are studying with this kind of data. Another statistician from WTO put it the following way that he mentioned that so the purpose of trade statistics is not to give a precise true point estimate. It is just to provide certain parameters which can give policymakers a descriptive idea of broader trends. The data is not made in order to derive inferences at some level of statistical significance. And whether it can be used for that purpose or not, I cannot judge. So you can see that the statisticians producing this data are being much more skeptical about the accuracy of these numbers and whether they really can be used as they often are in, in academic circles, at least without uh, paying more attention to these issues. And we also asked in our survey, then the economists tried to get a bit of, about what they think, like, like what can or should be done about this. And we uh, proposed in, in the survey the question whether they would agree if this data would be, for example, presented as confidence intervals rather than point estimates to better give a better, more clear indication that there is measurement uncertainty. Or we found that there was quite a lot of resistance to this kind of proposals among economists who thought that that would 
not be very practical and you, you would kind of undermine the, what, what they're trying to do and then would just raise more questions and would not be particularly helpful, which I think is, is interesting from a more of a sociology of knowledge perspective. The suggestions from that, that we kind of propose is, is mostly to create more awareness among data users. We also have then other follow-up papers in which we try to build some more concrete uh, statistical techniques that one can possibly use to, to account for some of these measurement errors, in particular in trade data, but uh, maybe also in, in other realms but also more generally to, to be more aware of these potential shortcomings and, and take them more seriously into account and also run some more data sensitivity analysis. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we've written quite a few papers uh, touching on this in different ways and looking at this from different angles. And I, I can say more about this in, in the Q and A. But otherwise for the rest of presentation, another. 10-15 minutes or so, I want to focus more on the ongoing project with uh, Francesco, Seiki and Len, in which we're trying to kind of extend this research agenda to the realm of illicit trade statistics. So in that research project, we start kind of the, the observation that statistics are and numbers generally are very prominent in, in, in politics nationally and internationally. But where we start then is that with the claim that it also builds on what I've just said, so that some of these numbers, they relate to certain phenomena and things that at least theoretically can be measured with a reasonable degree of accuracy. And I think merchandise trade would also fall under this category. So as I've just talked about, there's a lot of issues with merchandise trade data. It's far from perfect, but at least theoretically, it's, we know what we ideally would want to measure and there is some possibilities and that you can actually measure it. So it's containers moving from one country to another and we want to know the value of how, what is in this container, how much, how much is it worth. So this is kind of a merchandise trade flow. It's not easy to measure it, but it's at least possible. But then there's also other kinds of numbers circulated in international organizations and, and, and politics the political realm more generally, which are about phenomena, which are much more difficult than what we could even say near impossible to measure. And many of them relate to illicit activities. And if you think about things such as tax evasion, the volume of black market transactions, or also the trade in illicit uh, goods, such as trading in drugs or, or counterfeit products and so on. These are all transactions that are designed not to be monitored, right? So this has to be hidden. And so for these kinds of, tra of transactions, there's a, there's a big question if it's really even possible to measure something like that, because it's all designed in order to escape state surveillance, to not to be monitored. How could we even uh, think that we can measure these kinds of things? Nonetheless, as you probably know, there are a lot of numbers out there and a lot of uh, organizations trying to come up with estimates of how big this kind of illicit phenomena and also other uh, phenomena that are very difficult to measure are. And what is more, they're not only that there are these numbers, but more often than not, these numbers are also presented as if they were completely valid and accurate uh, point estimates, which clearly they are not. Can I give you here again two concrete illustrations of this. So this is from an OECD report ma mapping the real roots of trade in fake goods, in which they come up with some measures of the size of illicit trade. And they claim that in 2013, illicit trade was of, uh, accounted for $461 billion. And on the right, you can see also a breakdown of this 461 billion into different categories. 121 billion is in electronics, 41 billion in jewelry, and so on. So these are presented as kind of unproblematic numbers, which seem to be very precise, even though, of course, no smuggler is going to declare at the, at the customs how much uh, goods they, they are being moving to these other countries. So we can't really know with so much accuracy how, how much this trade really accounts for. Here, another example from a report from UNCTAD on illicit financial flows. 
which claims prominently so that the tax evasion from Africa to the West accounts for 88.6 billion US dollars. So again, a very precise figure on something that is really very difficult to measure with any kind of a degree of accuracy. So against this background, we ask kind of two questions. So the firstly, why is it in the first place that IOs publish this kind of numbers? And even more importantly for, for us, uh, for our paper and on why are they presented as if they were precise estimates, even though we know that they are not. And we propose kind of three different hypotheses why that might be the case. The first one we call the attention grabbing mechanism. So it might be that international organizations or other agencies releasing this kind of statistics do so because uh, having a precise number is better to capture the people's attention of a particular policy issue. They might see an issue as more important if we have a, a concrete number that, that captures it, then we, we don't do not. So it might be this kind of, a, for this reason that they, they want to have this number and present it as precise numbers. The second possibility or mechanism would be what we call the competence mechanism, which is similar, but slightly different. So it might be that it's not just that the, the issue is being perceived more, more important, but it might be also be that the organization that publishes the number might be seen as an expert or might be seen as more competent if they can give the audience a precise number rather than they talking about an issue just in, in words or just in text. The third hypothesis is on organizational mechanisms, which is a bit different from the attention grabbing and competence ones, which is that the the presentation of precise numbers on phenomena that can be hard to measure might also derive from certain bureaucratic cultures, professional norms, or internal politics of the organization. So then we try to evaluate this hypothesis with the mixed methods a design in which we compare the politics of merchandise trade figures drawing on some of the research presented in the first part to those of illicit trade, which are much more difficult to measure. So we do a review of many official documents that are and reports on illicit trade statistics and the methodologies that are being used. We run a number of semi-structured interviews in total of about 27 statisticians and other IO officials. Um, complement this with a large-scale survey experiment with a random sample of 2,000 American citizens. And we also have a second survey with uh, professional economists and I.O. staff uh, around 200. So now let me briefly talk about each one of these mechanisms. So first, the attention-grabbing mechanism. Again, the idea here is that organizations might want to present mock precise figures to because they think that the it makes draw people's attention to the issue, make them feel that an issue is more important. And we asked in the survey of uh, IO officials and, and economists whether they think that plays a role. As you can see, economists and policymakers do believe that numbers increase the perceived importance of an issue, with large majorities strongly agreeing or somewhat agreeing to the statement that using a more precise number is helpful because it increases the perceived importance of issues. But whether this is also the case is what we study with the survey experiment that I mentioned, which we run with the 2000 US citizens. And we do this kind of vignette experiments as it is called. So the idea of a vignette experiment is that you prime respondents with different so-called treatments, which I'll, I'll show you in a second and then see whether it depends, uh, depending on which treatment that the respondent has been exposed to, how they answer to certain follow-up questions. So we first have the baseline vignette or, or treatment is that we present them with this statement that, that today the United Nations announced that according to their statistics, illicit merchandise trade amounted to a record high in the first quarter of 2021. One third of the respondents see this vignette or, or treatment, and then two thirds, uh, one third sees the same treatment, but with a rounded number. So it's the same statement. We just add a specific number to it. So to a record high of five trillion US dollar. And then the final third of respondents, they get a precise number treatment. It's again, all the same, but instead of five trillion, we give a more precise number, 4.98. And so what we want to test with this is whether it matters, whether a respondent sees a number or a precise number, 
or just the text and how important they find the issue of, of illicit trade or merchandise trade. And what we find is, which is interesting against the contrast to what uh, policymakers seem to believe, we find actually no evidence at all that it affects how important that respondents find uh, an issue to be. So after seeing this vignette, we asked them whether they agree with the following statement, the United Nations should pay more attention to issues surrounding international illicit or merchandise trade, depending on what they've seen before. As you can see on the right, it really does not make a difference. Overall, the people find it's somewhat more important to tackle illicit trade rather than paying more attention to merchandise trade, but whether they've seen a, just a text, a rounded or a precise number doesn't affect that judgment. Then the second mechanism, which is the competence mechanism. So remember, this is similar but somewhat different to the first one, in which there might be the case that organizations release these numbers because they think that it makes them seem more, more competent to be an expert on a topic. And to do this, we do the same thing with the different vignettes, and then we ask them different kinds of questions. And we also ask the economists and policymakers whether they believe in the first place this to be the case. Like for the attention grabbing, also here we find that the policymakers and professional economists, they mostly agree, strongly or somewhat agree with the idea that a more precise number is helpful to increase the perceived competence of the organization. But again, just like for the attention grabbing, we find no evidence that this actually works in practice in our survey experiments. After the vignettes, we also ask respondents whether they find it, how credible they find the United Nations statement and also how competent they find the United Nations to handle this issue, so illicit or, or merchandise trade. And as you can see on the graphs, we find essentially that there's no difference. It doesn't seem to matter whether they see a text or a rounded or a precise number. So the bottom line from these first two mechanisms that on the I.O. side, so the people producing the number, they do seem to believe that the numbers do have these kinds of effects to give more, make them seem more competent, but also make issues seem more important. But we do not really see that confirmed in, in, in the survey experiment with, with the public opinion. So then our third mechanism, which is more about the internal politics of the I.O.s, it's a bit more rich and I don't have much time to go in, into much detail here, but it's more coming out of the, the interviews that we've conducted. We identify a number of, kind of political dynamics, which indeed appear to be quite important in driving this production of kind of mock accurate numbers on illicit trade and other phenomena. And one relates, which is quite prominent, is the demand from behalf of policymakers. We find also that to be quite a strong divide inside of international organizations between statisticians and more the policy peoples. As one uh, interviewee uh, talked about it, so when I talk to policy people, they want a number. People don't like uncertainty. They don't like ranges. You know, for me, if I'm doing my job properly, I have to be clear about uncertainty. There's the midpoint of the estimate and there's the range around. But ironically, if you do that, most policy people will tell you that you're not doing your job properly. If you can't give me a number, that means that you're not doing your job properly. But it's quite interesting that from the statistician's view, they are much more concerned about the problems with these measures and they also try hard to kind of get across the message that there are certain uncertainties attached to this. But on the policy side and also on behalf of politicians, there is no desire to really engage in that, which we also found creates quite some frustration among statisticians. They just want to have this number that they can use in their speech and they don't really care about all the footnotes that might be attached to the number. The second range of reasons that mentioned is also that statisticians worry that if you are too open about the measurement problems or if you give different kinds of numbers, it will uh, make it facilitate numbers shopping by political actors that they will use whichever number suits their discourse best. And finally, also number of practical concerns on the behalf of data producers that they find it very hard to communicate why there is uncertainty. This is also what's been captured in the quote that I just read, so that it actually might open them up to criticism if they're more open about the, the, the shortcomings and uncertainty attached to a number, people might start 
to question more what they're doing and blame them for not giving them a better number because maybe also kind of a lack of, of, of appreciation of how difficult it is to, to arrive at these kinds of numbers and produce this kind of data. All right, so conclusions so far from, from this work in progress. So one takeaway is that people do not seem to be so easily fooled by numbers, which in some ways, I guess, is a kind of a constructive, positive takeaway. So against the beliefs of economic policy makers in the survey, these, the numbers do not seem to really affect the judgment of, of people so much. And I, I think the concept of, kind of rational ignorance quite nicely kind of captures a lot of, of, of the politics of data that is going on both on the producer and the user side. A lot of acknowledgement and some awareness that the data is actually not that great and, and that there, there is some questions about how precise it can possibly be. But there's different kinds of professional incentives or other kind of rational ignorance motives why both on the producer and user side there's a strong incentive to kind of downplay these uncertainties and, and stick with the mock precise number rather than admitting more forcefully to certain imperfections. So last but not least, I think it also has important kind of takeaways for more broadly about science in societies and we think that this kind of state of affairs is also potentially quite problematic because we tend to pretend to know things more accurately than we really do and that might also create some problems in, in the longer term in, in kind of undermining the, the trust in science because sooner or later it's always it comes out that actually the numbers aren't that precise as, as we claimed in the first place which then can encourage more more mistrust towards science more broadly so we think that's also an important issue to think about more and think about ways to address it and better communicate the uncertainties that are inherent in scientific research more generally in, in ways that it is also more comprehensible to the wider public. And I'll leave it at that and look forward to your questions and comments you may have. Perfect. Thank you very much, Lucas. This was very interesting. Um, of course, I'm biased for the second part of your talk. <laughs> But I would really like to thank you uh, for uh, for this presentation. And um, before uh, uh, before uh, we close the recording, I also want to thank uh, the viewer of this uh, webinar because now we're going to stop the recording. But I would also like to invite all the viewers for the all to watch um, the previous events that we have organized and uh, to follow the activities on our social media from uh, uh, for the Agricola School and for the Lisitre Group. So thank you very much and now we can stop the recording.